OK, aloha, trailblazers. <laughs> the correct response is aloha, Big Marty. <laughs> OK. Aloha, trailblazers. Aloha. That was very weak. <laughs> I'll try it one more time. Aloha, trailblazers. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. <laughs> so we're going to talk about CDPs. And I have four chairs up here. One, two, three, four, five chairs. So I'll be sitting around. Hi, hey, Paula. <laughs> so CDP, this is a hot topic. I'm, I'm a SVP of product strategy at Salesforce. I was a Gartner for years. I covered the CDP and DMP. And last year, we did an inventory of our inquiry topic. So this is the, the questions that our clients at Gartner asked us. That's an analyst firm. The number one area was CDP. Number one, by far, actually, in the marketing space. More than analytics, attribution, you know, uh, DMP. And last year, also you heard of Ad Exchanger, Ad Exchanger publication. I wrote a piece called, based on my work at Gartner, called, What is this thing we call a CDP? That was the second most read column in Ad Exchanger last year. Number two, do you know what the number one most read column in Ad Exchanger last year was? Also written by me, by coincidence, not really. <laughs> um, it was called, did Google just kill independent attribution? Google cut off the data feed. Did that bother anybody? Did that bother? OK, topic for a different day. So before we start on CDPs, I want to uh, uh, get our brains working a little bit. And you look fairly intelligent, most of you. So I'm going to ask you some trivia questions. <laughs> OK, they're about the Fairmont. Two questions. One is, uh, the Fairmont survived a big earthquake in San Francisco. This hotel did. What year was the earthquake? 1906. Oh, six. Good man. Yes, you get a CDP later. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I have a few. All right, number two. This hotel, the Fairmont, was a star in character. It starred as a hotel in a series in the 1980s that ran for five years. What was the name of that series? Hotel. Hotel. Very good. <laughs> Not bad. OK. Final trivia question. From 2012 to 2016, there was a show on Showtime called House of Lies about a completely debauched, amoral, womanizing management consultant named Marty Kahn. He was based on a real person, this character. Who was that person? Who is that person? Big Marty. Big Marty. Another CDP for you, buddy. <laughs> Me. This is a true story. Sometimes I leave it there. It really is a trivia question now because the show was canceled. But in my youth, I wrote, I was a management consultant. I wrote a book called House of Lies, a tell-all. I was a very angry little management consultant. And I wrote this thing. I was like, oh, I'm so unhappy. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And uh, it was turned into a television show. And they completely changed my character. Like, the opposite of me. You could probably tell, any of you have seen the show. Comple it's, but it was good for my brand. So I, I keep mentioning this, and I'll probably get away with it a couple more years. OK. So <laughs> CDP. It's an interesting category, because we know when it was born. It has a birthday, this tech category. Does anyone know the birthday? 2013, a guy named David Robb a very capable MarTech analyst, kind of a one-man show based in Philadelphia, came out with a report called A Guide to Customer Data Platforms. And I have the report, part of it here, and I will quote it, 2013. So David Robb said, marketers face a growing gap between what they need from their customer databases and what those databases actually can do. So what's interesting here, he's seeing the CDP as a customer database. And he's a MarTech guy, came out of CRM, so it's very much in the database sphere. Another thing he said was reasons for the integration gap, note that integration gap, include lack of technology, missing marketer skills, and organizational fiefdoms. Now that, I think, is very interesting, because most CDP conversations are very vendor-centric. There's a lot of hype, a lot of hype, we'll say, from everybody. And uh, it's very much as though, let, let's, let's acquire this tech, and it will solve our problems. The problem, though, is not going to be cured or solved or created, by, for that matter, by any kind of technology. It's a bigger problem. The problem is related to organizational fiefdoms, exactly what he says there. Organizational dysfunction, you know, a lot of different systems. So CDP is a uh, solution to a bigger problem. Okay. 
The other thing I will say is that I think he overstated the case when he implied that both the problem and the solution are new. They're not new. This is my big theme for the day. How do I know they're not new? Well, I'm a student of marketing technology. I'm older than some of you, but I don't think all of you. If we go back to 1963, before even I was born, in rural Wisconsin, the Society of the Divine Savior Data Processing Center. This is real. <laughs> I'm not making this story up. Those two are religious people, but they're also data processors. They use an IBM 650 Series 900 data processing system. What do they do with it? Well, they solicit do donations from the flock for various worthy causes. So, this system is capable of taking in 500 punch cards. Back then, that's how you talk to a computer. I guess you put in punch cards. 500 a minute. It could output 1,000 mailing labels. It could print 800 lines in that kind of automatic typewriter thing on the right, 800 lines of custom letterhead. And for this massive effort, they got an 80% response rate, 8-0. Life was good in 1963. <laughs> Imagine, uh, and they paid for it, believe me. IBM you know, was not uh, successful for no reason. They were paying $12,000 a month for this thing, which in today's dollars is $2 million a year, which actually isn't that far off if you have a big enterprise. Uh, and so it was an extremely successful uh, operation that they had. Now this is their MarTech stack, the Savior's MarTech stack. So they have the data input in. And I, I, you know, frankly, what my point I'm trying to make here is that we're doing the same thing today. It's exactly the same. We're all trying to get back to 1963. So we have structured data on the left, put in in a readable format. It's highly structured. Data tape, so that's storage. The, everything was on tape back then, apparently. Then the processing, so this is sort of extraction and processing of data. Then the label printer, so they have activation. They have one channel, direct mail. Life is good, right? And then they had measurement. That's that person on the bottom there. So they would get the mailing back, and they'd mark up who responded and who didn't. They had a single view of the customer. On the tape, every person had a row. There were 156 alphanumeric characters attached to the person. This is PII now, so they had name and address. 156 characters, and that was coded information. Gender, size of household, income level, and what we call propensity scores. Likelihood to respond to certain types of mailings. Likelihood to give to certain types of causes. This caused the 80% response rate. So what does this tell us? First of all, what we're trying to do today is not new. It has been done better in the past. And if you do it right, you can be very successful. So I think that this, this is a CDP, this thing. Now, what happens? So time goes on, and you know life gets more complicated. and. Uh, Various things happened since the 60s, especially in the late 60s, I hear, but that's a whole different thing. <laughs> and so there are, there are lots of things going on. These are the four forces, and then there's another bigger one on the next slide. So this is what we're all dealing with today. Uh, integration. So we all know this. You have to move from channels to platform. I blame, who do I blame for this? Delta Airlines. Delta Airlines, you change your, your seat on your app, and you go to the kiosk, you really expect the kiosk will know what you just did. Or you know, if I, uh, I'm looking for some kind of flight on my browser and then I open up my mobile browser, I'm sort of hoping that they'll kind of meet me halfway about what I was looking for. That's the Delta Airlines effect, moving from individual channels to more of a platform, omnichannel. Audiences to people. This, actually we have a clear culprit for this one, this Facebook. Four or five years ago, Facebook started talking about people-based marketing. PBM, now all of us want to do people-based marketing today. We didn't say that six years ago. So you know that is Facebook's fault. Facebook does it you know, well. They have some advantages we don't need to get into. But essentially, a lot of the impetus behind the CDP is that it needs user-level data. You want to be able to personalize to an individual. Uh, you want to be able to deliver you know, whatever's relevant to that person. So that's a big shift, moving from groups of people to people. That requires all kinds of pain. And that's another thing the CDP is trying to address. The other thing is analytics. This actually is more hopeful. Companies like Facebook, our friends there, and Google in particular, 
have invested a lot in developing analytic frameworks, a lot of code, and then they just give it away. You or I can open up our laptop tomorrow and start doing really good you know, AI. We can do image recognition models without too much effort. And it's because other people have developed this code and they're giving it to us. Um, the, the reasons there, there's a lot of reasons, but one is it's very hard to make money on an analytic product. The second thing is they want widespread adoption of these tools. So AI is good. I recommend you all try it. I had a whole other thing. There's an episode of Silicon Valley, that show of a hot dog or not. Have you seen that one? <laughs> you, you can take a picture of uh, something and it tell you if it's a hot dog or if it's not a hot dog. And there's a really good blog post, the guy who did that, he was a grad student working for the show, and he developed this. That's AI, that's image recognition. And he described it, and you can get the code online too. And it's really interesting, you can read through it, it's not that hard to understand. And that's AI, and we could do it. You know, and, he, and he used his um, Mac, MacBook Pro, to do it. So. Then the other thing is speed. This is the hardest one, actually, asynchronous to contextual. So, it used to be, and actually still today, somebody does something, and then you do a, an upload overnight. So you do kind of a batch, and then the next day you'll be able to act on it. The thought now is that, well, what if they do it in that session? Wouldn't you be able, like to be able to personalize? So if I'm looking at ski boots on page one, page two, maybe I'll get some kind of relevant something or other. Or if you can tell that I'm a male, pretty much, or I'm shopping for a male, why not make my experience reflect that? Um, that's that's um, contextual. That's what we call real-time personalization. It can be done well in a single channel, but to do that across channels is actually sort of a world of pain. The other bigger change is what's happened to marketing, marketing as a function. Marketing itself, whether we like it or not, has become the de facto owner of customer experience. We own it. And I say whether we like it or not. It's kind of like one of these potatoes. You're like, you take it. No, you take it. I don't want customer experience. You take it. Um, I think it landed with marketing because we're supposed to understand people. If you've ever worked with IT, you'll, you'll understand that's an advantage. <laughs> it's a little IT bashing, I'm sorry. Um, marketing, uh, the, the, the trouble that, you know, both at Salesforce and at Gartner, we, do, we looked a lot at who's influencing MarTech buying decisions. So who makes the decision? And over the years, it's really a clear trend. It's more and more in the marketing world. So the CMO has more influence every year over proposing tech, um, evaluating tech, buying it, coming up with the budget. With that increased responsibility, it becomes a lot more pressure. They have a P&L, they have numbers to hit, they become very upset, and it causes what I call the drama of the gifted child, which is that marketers now think they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, nobody likes us. Does anyone remember the drama of the gifted child? That was a book that everyone read like in the 80s. Everyone, nobody remembers this, okay. Um, <laughs> it was psychology, it was sort of like reading Ayn Rand or something, it's a big ego trip. You read it and you're like, oh my God, I'm gifted, I'm gifted, but it's caused all these problems in my life, I'm so insecure. It was a big trend, I guess maybe not anymore. All right. Um, <laughs> So that's what happened to marketers. They become very, very insecure. And if we ponder the change in the marketing function, it makes a lot of sense. When I was in business school, 2001, 2002, you could tell somebody was interested in marketing just by looking at them. They dressed better. They had better hair. They were very interested in meeting celebrities. I was one of these people, um, you know, sort of. And uh, we were interested in colors and talking about storytelling and the hero's journey. That's, uh, it's wonderful, all that stuff's very important. But what happened over time, the last 15 years, is now they, that same person has had to transfer into somebody who can give credible instructions to PhDs in data science who are from Russia, who don't even know who Taylor Swift is, have no interest in celebrities. It's, it's, a, it's a different job, but it's the same person, because the other stuff's still important. Storytelling, colors, et cetera. So what does, this, what does this mean for the CDP conversation? Well, if you turn somebody on the left, into somebody on the right, what do they want? They want their own database. They would like their own database that they could use. That's all. So I think the CDP, if I want to just summarize it in my own language, is a very usable customer database for marketers. I, I tweeted this once, and I, my tweets don't get a lot of you know, reaction, but this one got a little, but it was like, um, the more I think about the CDP, the more it looks like the CMO's ultimate revenge on the CIO. If we think about that, there's some truth to that. 
We just don't want to deal with the IT queue anymore. We don't want people telling us, oh, you know, we can't build that data, but we'll do our own data lake. We'll do a data mart. We're like, I've been waiting six years for this frickin' data mart. Where is it? I'll just go buy, I just gotta get my own. Forget it. I'm gonna, so that's CDP. Okay. Integration. <laughs> we all know this. Unilever actually said they have 400 sources of data, so this seems like a really low number. But every year you're dealing with more. We could say that. It's a 25% compound annual growth rate. 25%. Now I did the math. These, and these are significant sources of enterprise data. This is not every single data vendor you deal with. Um, so if enterprise has 15 sources, this would include content management and email systems and you know, ERPs probably and things like that. Um, if, you continue, if we continue this 25% growth rate, in 10 years we have 140 sources of data. And in 100 years, just for fun, I did in 100 years at 25% annual growth rate. Anyone do that math in their head? Anyone? Yeah. It's well over 7 billion. It's actually 73.6 billion. So that's a lot of data, a lot of sources of data. So get ready. There's a lot of connectors you're going to have to write. Right, Paul? <laughs> so integration, data sources. That's one thing. And then the other thing is these are the two themes for the CDP, identity. Now, yesterday on this very stage right here, sitting in these chairs, there was a panel on identity. So I won't add anything to that, except to say that this is, more, this is harder than it looks. If we're dealing just with first party systems, we need to do sort of fuzzy matching and then people have different personas. So it's not really people-based marketing, it's persona-based marketing. I'll give a certain email to a certain company because I don't trust them. I'll give another email to another company because I, I like them, but that's kind of my nerdy email. And then I have another one around my pet loving stuff. And so we all have personas. How do you know it's the same person? Sometimes you really just don't. Sometimes you do. Sometimes people authenticate. And then if you happen to have a DMP in your stack, DMPs tend to deal with anonymous data, cookies, mobile ad IDs. How do you connect um, anonymous or proxy data with known data? Well, we're at a live ramp conference, so that's one answer. Onboarding. Onboarding has a certain match rate. Do you do re-identification? You can't do re-identification from anonymous to known unless you have consent. That's like a big no-no. So if someone authenticates, they come on, they have to check a box. Yes, you can re-identify me. So consent is a big part of this. Um, so let's think about these two things. I want integration from all my data sources, harmonized. Think of it as a big table. We have columns and we have rows. The rows are people, and I've done this identity matching, and the columns are my attributes, and they've been harmonized, so they have the same names. What is that? What is that thing I've just described? There's a simple term for it, I think. I think it's CRM. So, <laughs> I will point out now, I work for a company, our ticker symbol is CRM. So I, I guess it's not completely unbiased, but taking, you know, stepping back and looking at the CDP space, and I'm not talking about individual vendors here, I'm talking about the Weltanschauung, when people are, are demanding a CDP, I think what they're asking for is B2C CRM.3.0 or whatever. That's what it is. In fact, if you look at the discussion around CDP at its more, at its more grandiose, it's the entire MarTech stack. It's everything from integration to organization to analytics to activation. What else is there? There's nothing left. So I think we need to just admit CDP is not a category. It's just a new name we're giving for everything we do. Do we buy that? Some of us do. Some of us are wondering. OK, so I'll get more pointed now here. Uh, in terms of the category. So there, there are two ways to look at it, like a pincer-like maneuver. And I've been pondering this probably a little too much. What is the CDP? What is the CDP? Uh, I've even asked David Robb, who is a lovely man. He has the CDP Institute in Philadelphia. And they ha he has, you know, probably over 100 members now, vendors calling themselves CDPs. If you look, they're all very different. You know, they're all different. But if you piece them all together, maybe, maybe you have this. Huh? But, at any rate, he has his own definition, so I'll get to that in a second. And then what I did was I looked at what marketers were asking for. Because those are two different things. We can appreciate that. What vendors are offering, and then on the other side, what, what are marketers asking for when they're asking for a CDP? What do they think they want? And ideally, they would meet in the middle. But let's look at what those two things are. So first of all, from the vendor side, um, Customer Data Platform Institute has this, more or less this. This is an adaptation. When I was at Gartner, we had something very similar. So this seems to be what a CDP describes itself as. 
It has these components. Acquisition. Acquisition could be through FTP file transfer, or it could be through tags and pixels and beacons and so that. Uh, uh, two ways, streaming data transfer and then in batch. So that seems to be implied, although you could do just batch, I guess. So acquisition, processing. This part is difficult. Cleaning and deduping. Is the data valid? This is sort of like data validation. Matching fields, matching identities. Matching fields is what I'm talking about, the columns, so the attributes. If you have address in one database and ADDR1 in another, that seems trivial. It really isn't. How do we know it's the same thing? We've got to do a lot of harmonization. Then there's expose, which is storage and making data available, and then analytics. Some CDP-like objects do that better than others. Then delivery. We'll get to that in a second. I think that there is uh, an underappreciated nuance to this picture, and it's that thing I've circled, the expose part. And, and, and uh, the, the Data Platform Institute lately, I've noticed, they've kind of they've begun to nuance this themselves and, and even admitted that this was oversimplification in the early stages of CDP. There's an issue of latency, okay? Um, in the hot dog or not example, so we have a big database full of images of hot dogs, and we're trying to build a model, a model that will recognize hot dogs or not. That model, to train it using um, neural network, took 80 hours. 80 hours, that's pretty fast, so the guys, and he had a good system. That's not real time. I mean, that's, that's some heavy lifting. And that required, you know, data that he had collected over many weeks and put in this storage and then done some analytics on top of it. That's not the kind of, you know, process that you can, and it's an extreme example, to operationalize it for marketing. To operationalize something for marketing, someone appears on your site, you want to be able to look them up right away. So you do a lookup or you follow a rule and then you get their score. Are they high value? Are they not high value? You're not going to build the high valuation model in that moment. So there's a big difference between massive data storage for analytical modeling purposes and data availability. There's a latency difference. And the data availability point, store a subset for fast access, means you move that, you move the score closer to the point of execution. You move it closer to the email system, closer to the site, without creating a silo. CDPs usually do one or they do the other, but they don't do both. They'll make data available for personalization on a website, like offer management, or they'll give you a database where you can do analytics and modeling, but they don't do both. And the reason is probably, you know, the underlying technology doesn't work that way. You can't have a massive database upon which you could do, you know, we just, we're not there yet. Maybe we will be in quantum computing in 10 years, but that's just not how tech works today. So we have to be realistic about the capabilities of the CDP. Now, the RFPs. I looked at all these RFPs. Any of you issued an RFP for a CDP? Nobody. Someone is not. There's a lot of them out there. They just appeared last year, just tons of them. And I was reading through them, and I'm like, what, what, what are they asking for? And uh, it's, you know, it's hard to read an RFP. <laughs> They're long. And um, they're really all over the place. There's a couple things that are striking about this. One is that really no one knows what this category is supposed to deliver, so they're asking for everything. <laughs> and these are sophisticated companies. These are big names. And these are you know, the data science teams and, 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 and smart people. And they're like asking for A through Z. And I think the response will be, I'm not sure what the responses are, but probably you know, we can do some of these and then some of these we can't. So number one, a hodgepodge of definitions, which is the definition of an early stage category. Second thing is uh, the use cases are few and far between. Now my big takeaway from the identity panel yesterday was if you're going to enter into a CDP project, make sure you know very clearly what you think you're going to accomplish with the CDP. It's much more important that you have something to accomplish that you can evaluate then that you get you know, your single view of the customer. Here are some of the goals that came up in the RFPs. I want to prevent overlap. I want to do segmentation. That sounds pretty good. Cross-channel personalization. That's pretty vague. What is that exactly? Um, predictive segments, that's not bad. Upsell and cross-sell. I mean, who doesn't want to? 
Offer management. Here's a good one. Determine the best way to engage. That's not a use case. Determine the best way to engage. That's like what you would hire a consultant for. You do a big project and tell me the best way to engage. So anyway, clear use case. Put a point on it. Um, there really are two themes. There really are two. And I, I really, I'll boil down the CDP world into two types. One is a system of insight, and the other is a system of engagement. There are requirements around real-time personalization. If you have offer management, you want to do coupons, you want to, um, you want to personalize uh, mobile, mobile in-app mes messaging in real time, you want to personalize the site experience in real time. That's real, and that's a category. And then the other one is a marketing database. And that's when you talk about predict building predictive models, doing better segmentation, um, even doing better measurement. So that's, that's real as well. But they're distinct, and it gets at that distinction I was trying to point out in the previous slide, which is that this one on the bottom, the system of insight, uh, is not real time. And the one on the top, system of engagement, is. And by real time, I mean in under 70 milliseconds. So CDPs, people want both of these things. Like this, system of insight and a system of engagement. Existing CDPs. I would argue, do one or they do the other. And it, uh, it's based on where they started, frankly. Most of them either started in an engagement channel and expanded out to the, to the CDP category, or this one here, they started as a kind of new type of marketing database, single view of the customer, and expanded up into engagement channels um, or trying to expand up into engagement channels. If you look at the VC world today, so venture, venture funding, nobody is going to fund a combined enterprise CDP. It's too ambitious, too difficult, it would take too long, but they might fund some of the things on the upper left or potentially some of the things on the lower left. Now, this is fine. If you are issuing an RFP for a CDP and you really do want a unified user profile, just look at the universe of CDPs that are in that space and then do your evaluation there. Don't assume that all CDPs are in that space. Likewise, if you're trying to do real-time personalization on a single channel or a single um, form factor, we'll say some of them are good at mobile, then combine your, your uh, quest to that area. So my contention is this thing on the right, the enterprise CDP, does not exist yet. There aren't that many companies that could deliver it. There are some. Uh, they're big. They're, you can probably think of who they are. And uh, they'll get there. Um, but it's a very ambitious category. And there's another nuance that I haven't talked about, which is what about the DMP? Has anyone been thinking about DMP at all in the context of this? So where does DMP fit? Well, there's two flavors to the DMP conversation. One is, where are DMPs now? And the second thing is, where could DMPs go in the future? Where are DMPs now? If I had to distinguish, in, in that ad exchanger piece, I said I was baffled. And I admitted this was true when I first heard about the CDP and uh, confusion. People were like, oh, marketers are confused between the CDP and the DMP, and are they the same? Um, and I said, I don't, I don't understand that confusion at all. I really don't. So I came up from the DMP world. And I'm like, they're completely different. Why did I say that? Why was that my reaction? Well, DMP deals in the world of anonymous data, mostly for programmatic ad targeting. CDP deals in the world of known data, and they don't really talk about advertising that much. They're, they're different. <laughs> they, they are designed for different purposes. And you know, DMPs over time have adapted all kinds of identifiers outside the cookie, and CDPs over time have started to talk about ad targeting. But they're still really parallel systems, and that's what this drawing indicates. They uh, are complementary. And, and even the CDP vendors now will say, like peanut butter and jelly, the, um, David Katz at the M Particle wrote a thing. He's like, um, CDP, DMP go together. You know, they're, they're like a happy harmony. Treasure Data has a, have a, has a diagram where you have your CD, DMP over here and your CDP over here, and they, they uh, communicate and work together in parallel. That's you know, not a bad way to look at them. But I think if we think about DMP and the advantages that it has, DMP is used to dealing with massive scale. They do a lot of the things that CDPs want to do. They do great analytics. So you can do segmentation. You can build clusters at scale. 
much greater scale than, than CDPs because you're dealing with ad tech data. They do probabilistic identity matching. They have really a good identity framework in the anonymous world that CDPs don't have for the most part. Um, they have very low latency in many cases that you can do path analysis. So the DMP can do a lot of stuff that CDPs can't do. But it is, for now, trapped in this, in this sort of anonymous world um, with all the challenges that that brings. If, just hypothetically, you could imagine a DMP that started to ingest PII, personally identifiable information, and got over those hurdles, um, did you know, different types of identity matching, you could see a very fast, very large um, CDP. It's just sort of food for thought. So who knows where this world will go? But today, I would, I would emphasize that they are parallel systems. Um, this seems like not really the greatest slide to end on. <laughs> it doesn't really end with a bang, does it? It's like, where's the bang? So what I'm going to do is uh, I have one minute, if you'll bear with me. I'm just going to go through the whole thing again really fast. And so we can uh, just hit the highlights, you know, just the highlights. And, uh, and then we'll, we can come home, you know, with some real learnings here about CDP. Do we feel we understand the CDP better? I mean, I certainly do. I definitely do. And I think, uh, <laughs> and that's what's important, really, at the end of the day. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you got this guy, these guys here. I mean, I think, we, you know, we all kind of wish we were in rural Wisconsin in 1963, don't we? It's like life is so easy. Uh, so we have integration challenge, identity challenge, AI, speed. Marketing's role has expanded, and uh, marketing has an identity, <laughs> so, uh, identity and self-evaluation crisis. They're like a little Stuart Smalley syndrome. They've had to become smarter over time. That's made them require their own database, or at least desire their own database. They're dealing with more and more data sources over time. The identity issues become very difficult, to, and it's actually more of a custom solution that you're going to have to build yourself, frankly. I think CDP is really an extension and evolution of uh, CRM. On the, in the B2C space at B2C scale, and it's a natural evolution. The CDP Institute has an uh, expansive view of CDP, which they're nuancing now to uh, deal with the ex expose issue. And then uh, RFPs that come out are all over the place, but I would suggest when you're putting together your RFP, focusing on the use cases, real measurable use cases for your CDP, like object, engagement and insight, um, CDP of the future is going to combine engagement and insight, Existing CDPs have uh, limited delivery. DMP, parallel system today, but potentially a combined system tomorrow. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, just let me know. Thank you.